Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'd like to call to order the study session for the City Council for the City of Wheat Ridge, Colorado for May 20th, 2019. Uh, uh, for the record, we'll note that um, uh, Councilman Urban and Councilwoman Hoppy are not with us today, but otherwise we have a fully seated council. So <clears throat> I would like to uh, start with Citizen comments on any uh, agenda items? Is there anyone here from the public who would like to speak on any of the agenda items on our uh, list tonight? Okay, then we will, uh, we will go on to our first item of business. This is a Jefferson County financial update, and I'd like to uh, welcome C Commissioner Casey Ty and uh, City Treasurer uh, Mr. Jerry DiTullio, who is uh, not a... <laughs> not a uh, Stranger to our midst, so uh, Mr. DiTullio, welcome and please, uh, please take it away. Uh, thanks for having us tonight. Um, as your county treasurer and as Commissioner Ty, what we've noticed in the past is that there seems to be a disconnect, and we're hitting all the cities, by the way. We're going to go to our Vada City Council, um, Weaver City Council. We, you're our guinea pigs on this presentation. But what happened was is the, um, the county commissioners and Public Affairs has created a Speakers Bureau, and the Speakers Bureau at the county is to inform the public about the county, county services, what they do, and to inform the public about potential budget uh, shortfalls and challenges coming up in 2020. And so uh, what I've been doing is contacting cities and go to their study sessions and get the information out to the councils. Uh, but there's an ulterior motive here is that everything's on Channel 8, so I'm trying to reach the public a little bit more than just uh, the city councils. We're trying to hit the, the um, Channel 8 folks that watch in Arvada, Lakewood, Wheat Ridge. So our presentation is fairly short. It's just about the county, what's going on at the county, and then Mr. Atai will talk about, Commissioner Atai will talk about a few of the, the budget, budget issues that are coming up in 2020. But the main thing is, is feel free to ask questions. This is informative. Uh, this presentation is going out to a lot of different folks in a lot of different places. So I'm gonna drive the first part of it with the PowerPoint and then, uh, ooh, PowerPoints. Remember how I used to hate PowerPoints on City Council. Then Commissioner Todd will start jumping in too. So if you have any questions at the end, let us know. We'll try to keep it as short as possible for questions. So like I mentioned, the goal was to actually inform the public about the county, what the county services are. So this is our first slide about getting to know your county. Um, some short facts about the county is that it's the fourth most populated county in Colorado. Uh, we are, we're 774 square miles, and there's more than uh, 550,000 residents. And I think what the, the concern is that we've seen is that a lot of citizens don't know where the county begins and the city ends and vice versa. So they, do, do they call the county? Do they call the state? Do they call the city? And it, obviously, there's, the city of Wheat Ridge is in Jefferson County. But there's unincorporated parts of Jefferson County that don't have a city like Applewood, certain parts of Green Mountain. Green Mountain itself isn't a city, it's an area in Jefferson County. Um, just some little quick facts about uh, the county. I don't know if you knew this, but um, there's 2,900 miles of paved roads in the county. Uh, the road and bridge uses 100% of the asphalt that is removed from roads, 100% for recycling and reuse on the, on the roads. We have 28 open space parks. There's 236 miles of trails. Uh, Jefferson County will be 158 years old in 2019. Does anybody have an idea what the largest city might be in Jefferson County? Ain't we want to guess? Lakewood. Lakewood, correct. And how about the smallest city? I think everybody knows that one. Lakeside. Lakeside, correct. Adjust your microphone. So I'm going to ask Commissioner Ty to kind of go over the mission and vision. This has been kind of created since before I was there. Yeah, we, we have, uh, th these were updated just uh, a couple years ago. And we're looking at all of our services now. I'm gonna talk more going forward about some of the budget challenges. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, we wanna make sure that everything we do meets the mission, vision, values, and goals. And you'll see kind of a theme through there that, that safety, health, and well-being are, are in each of those mission, visions, and values. And we really wanna emphasize that every, everything we, we every, activity that we emphasize in county government has to meet one of these uh, mission, vision, or values. And so we hope we can streamline government in that regard by, by having a focus on, on what it is we're doing in our new operations. I'm going to skip this video. It's probably 
two minutes long, but we'll keep going. It, it is on YouTube, though, so if you, if you can take a look at it, it's a pretty good kind of overview of the county. So in, in general, we wanted to kind of explain what the county, who makes up the county. We started in alphabetical order. It's the assessor, the Board of County Commissioners. So the Board of County Commissioners is just like a city council for the county. They do land use and work at, uh, with the assessor. You have the clerk and recorder, uh, the coroner, county attorney, all the way down to the surveyor and the treasurer. So these are the basic departments that you'll see in the county. Uh, the district attorney is processing uh, obviously felony cases. A lot of the city's cases are referred to the DA and to the county. Um, public health is a big one. Uh, public affairs is our, our public affairs, but we have a lot of with public health. Um, just real quickly, the public trustee, which works on foreclosures for the county, that was moved under the city tre county treasurer in 2020. So I will become the county treasurer and the public trustee in July 1st of 2020. So I'll have dual role and that person and that department's merged under the treasurer. The top 10 um, public trustees were appointed, top 10 county size, were appointed by the governor. So it's sort of a perk. The governor would get elected and say, hey, I'm gonna make Leah Dozeman my public trustee for Jefferson County as a campaign favor. So the legislature wanted to get rid of it back with Owens. He wouldn't get rid of it. Hickenlooper wouldn't get rid of it. But Jared Polis said that should be a county function all the way through because the other 54 counties the public trustee and the treasurer are the same. The top 10 in size was a separate department. So this will actually make things more efficient, more accountable, because the trustee was working for the state, but the state was never out there monitoring what was going on. So now the public trustee will be under the treasurer, under the county. So I, did you want to talk about some of these, these percentages? Um, I could, the 34% the of parents increase their income. I was talking to our budget department about that today, and there's a group called, or a program in Jefferson County called Jeffco Prosperity Partners, and they work with these families to actually help them improve their jobs, improve their um, employability, actually earn more money to support their families to get them out of the system. And so in uh, 2018, 34% of those families actually improved their um, income to get out of the system and actually be self-sufficient. I don't know if Mr. Commissioner Ty wants to talk about some of the other ones. Well, you know, just regarding like Jeff Co. Prosperity Partners, one of the ideas of that being that we want to make sure that um, what causes poverty a lot of times is it has to do with you know transportation or job training, and we want to have wraparound services around those families. And it's been very successful. We've partnered with the business community where they'll help provide services such as auto repair at a discounted rate through the program. And it's been very successful. And we're hoping to expand it. We talked about the Ridge property at one time. We're hoping to you know find some, some areas where we can expand uh, some housing opportunities in addition to the, the current uh, prosperity project. We're looking all over the county for ideas of where we can have uh, some affordable housing in addition to these other services. Um, and then that, that 4.35 million saved, that's part of our, our initiative. We call it um, Resilient Jeffco. We've asked each office to look at how they provide services and identify savings. And we've been very uh, successful so far, and we're going to keep pushing the envelope in that regard. So this is your property taxes. This is where my department comes in. So the, tre the treasurer in January sends out 220,000 property tax notices, and that's for about 250 taxing entities, like the school district, uh, metro districts, which you've been dealt with uh, recently, the fire districts. And um, we sent out those 220,000 tax notices for those 250 taxing entities. And then over the course of the year, we, dis we disperse those taxes as they come in once a month. That's about a billion dollars in money coming in and going out over the county. So this is, pretend this is a dollar. So 50 cents of every dollar collected in property tax goes to the school district. 21% um, goes to the special district. That's like West Metro Fire. 3% uh, to the cities. That's your mill levy. 2% uh, to urban renewal. We actually have to collect the money for urban renewal now and metro districts as a treasurer and get that information back to the, to the um, cities. The metro district is what you're dealing with now. That's basically a homeowners association on steroids. They actually tax themselves. They tell us that in November, December, what that mill levy is or amount is. We collect it and then we send it back to that metro district. They have a board and everything. 
So, uh, for example, the Yarrow property, I think they had, they're coming up with the Metro District. That money will be uh, disclosed to the county of how much they're going to collect. We'll collect it and then disperse it back to that board. And they use that money, they tax themselves, that money is used for public improvements. That's what, that's what it's supposed to be intended for. Streets, roads, whatever they're, they're fixing in that development. So that's actually a new way of financing residential property. The metro districts are really for residential type developments. That's what they're, that's the new, uh, you know, urban renewal and TIF is for the commercial and the metro district is for larger residential. So once again, this is our, only our general funds. So assume a dollar again. Right now, 66% of that dollar, or 66 cents, goes to safety. That's the sheriff, that's human services, a lot of the safety departments we have that's servicing the entire county. Um, health and well-being is, is that 8%? <laughs> and then stewardship is 26%. Stewardship is actually, that's where I'm at. That's um, the clerk and recorder, the assessor, and... Um, the treasurer and, and uh, so that's those departments is where we're at that's where we're, we're expense so where are county dollars uh, spent so a lot of people say well you're collecting all this money where does it go and why, why is the county not more um, in, in the black well so you have the the airport let me get my notes here some of these are actually the money is earmarked you can't go any farther with it let me just get my notes if we jump in there, for example, the airport, that's an enterprise. And so uh, any of the money from uh, the, the airport gets from leases on airport property and those kinds of things and grants from, from CDOT and other agencies, it has to be spent on that enterprise function. It can't go into the general fund. So the, the airport, uh, road and bridge projects, the open space projects, as you know, you pay the open space uh, tax, and then library, the funds that come into the county for those the departments of those projects stay with that group. You can't move that, can't shift that money around. No way of shifting any money around for those four. I think you wanted me to talk about the financial realities. So, you know, the general fund is, is when you look at, if you go back to that general fund chart, uh, you saw that most of the money, 66% uh, went to the uh, to safety. Uh, it, it was a little bit misleading because of the, the human services portion, which is only about 8%. A lot of that is federal match. So it, when, when you get to the, when you count all uh, resources, we, re we actually, between our three lines of effort, which are safety, uh, human services, or, and uh, uh, stewardship, it's about a third, a third, a third, if you count all sources of funds. But the general fund is where the uh, Board of County Commissioners has the most discretion in how money is spent. And we, as, as you saw on the chart, we get 24 cents of every dollar in property taxes, and, and we, we want to thank the taxpayers for, for that. But it is a challenge because we, um, we are limited by TABOR. And if you look at that chart, you'll see that the uh, expenditures starting about 1516 started exceeding our, um, reven our revenues. When we made a, a strategic decision around 14, 15, we were losing employees at a, at a high rate. And uh, it, it's very expensive to, to train employees, as you know, especially when you get things like law enforcement. So it takes a lot of money to train a sheriff's deputy. And then if they only stay with the agency for a year or two and, and they go to another jurisdiction that's paying a higher salary, that's just not a good business model. And we were losing sheriff's deputies at a high rate. We were losing district attorneys at a high rate. We were losing our human service workers at a very high rate. So we, we uh, made a conscious effort to increase salaries. And then we also had other expenses that were just uh, outpacing what the Tabor allows us to grow. The Tabor limitation on growth is, is, popular, is uh, inflation plus local growth, new build. And so uh, our expenses were just exceeding that. And we've been spending into our bank account over the last several years. And now we're down to the point where we just don't want to reduce the, our savings account anymore. We currently have approximately $28 million in our fund balance. And that's, that's about three months of expenditures, which is the amount that the Government Financial Officers Association recommends you keep. So. We don't want to get dip into our fund balance anymore. So we basically have about a $16 million delta between what we've 
we've been spending on programs and what our revenues will support. So we've talked to each of our uh, offices about reducing uh, their budgets by approximately 7%, and 7% will get us to $16 million. Um, that's a challenge, and of course, when you see that, you know, in the general fund, public safety being the largest piece of that, uh, maybe you've read in the paper that I know the sheriff has, has expressed some concerns about how we're gonna make that happen, but we're, gonna, we're working with each of the offices to figure out the best way to uh, to find those savings. And like I said, we've had Resilient Jeffco going on for a couple of years now, trying to make sure we're as streamlined as we can be. So we're, we're in the middle of those discussions, and we're looking at uh, budget reductions to get that $16 million. Uh, the other side of the coin is we have had discussions regarding Tabor and whether or not we want to go to the voters and ask for um, some type of a ballot measure to grant, allow us to keep the revenues that that our treasurer is collecting. Uh, we haven't made a decision yet, but currently, based upon the authorized mill levy, if we are collecting approximately $30 million more than uh, Tabor allows us to. Now, that, that's, that's not quite an accurate statement, so we're not actually collecting it, because what we've been doing is we've been reducing the mill levy. We've done a voluntary mill levy reduction each year. Rather than send people a check, that's very expensive, we just reduce the mill levy each year to stay within the Tabor limitations. So we've been reducing it now to where we, we, we could collect 30 million more than, than what we are being authorized. We're debating how much, if we were to go to the voters, how much of that 30 million we would be asking to keep based upon our needs and those kinds of things. But no decisions were made at this point. So I was gonna t talk briefly about this. So, in 1992, Douglas Bruce sponsored the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, which said that in Colorado, if you wanted to increase your taxes, you had to go to the vote of the people. And in 1992, personally, my whole family voted for it. And I still support that concept of going to the voters to ask to keep um, or to raise taxes. The, what the county is running into is this revenue cap computation that we collect funds legally but then we have to ask the voters to either keep it or give it back to the voters. For example, in 2017, um, we had a snowstorm or a hailstorm. Wheat Ridge was able to collect about, what, $5 million extra in cash on the permit fees. We, Wheat Ridge was able to keep that money because the city had D. Bruce a few years ago. D. Bruce as in Douglas Bruce. The county, here's where the rubber hits the road, the county has not D. Bruce ever. Uh, the commissioners have never referred a ballot to the voters saying, can we legally keep the money we've collected for these projects and for these services? So that's what the commissioners have to look at is, are we going to go to the voters and ask them to keep the revenue stream that we've collected, not raise taxes necessarily, because that's not really what they want to do. Is like, well, I shouldn't talk for them, but for me, I wouldn't support raising taxes, but I believe that legally collecting funds and keeping those funds for pro projects and services for the county makes sense. And so what I wanted to show you real quickly is a report that's on my uh, web page. So this is uh, the Jefferson County Treasurer, on the Jefferson County Treasurer's page. So in 2019, and Casey could jump in too, um, because we had, a, we had exceeded the revenue cap, the Board of County Commissioners had to lower the mill levies to make it work. So in 2005, or 2019, the county left $32 million that they couldn't collect. They gave it back to the voters through that property tax reduction on your tax bill, which you saw probably in January from me and from my department. So do you want to expand further maybe on this? Or? Well, just, you know, so the, the, one of the, I think, uh, things people don't really, uh, um, one of the challenges we have with Tabor too is, uh, we're limited in, in collecting in accepting state grants. When we reach our Tabor limit, which we've done each of the last five years, we have to not, we can't accept any additional state grants without reducing some other place. So we're telling some of our uh, employees that, you know, it's really a challenge to accept a state grant because it, it, it impacts our Tabor. And um, I know with, with, that's one of those things where you think, well, we want to take every state grant you can, but then it forces your hand in having to reduce somewhere else. So it's, I think, one of the unintended consequences of Tabor. So in 2017, for example, when they had the storm, the county refunded back about $19 million. So here's the rub for a county treasurer. Um, my department will generate in, in fees and services and revenue about $7.5 million in revenue 
which goes towards the taper cap and we're that's a percentage by state law that we are allowed to collect through state statutes plus we will invest funds and we'll generate about five million dollars in interest so about 12.5 million dollars all of that is applied to the revenue cap so if you have a event where you've gotten extra revenue like grants or you had a storm and you collected other funds that money has to be refunded back or you have to ask the voters to keep it previous board of county commissioners have never asked the voters to keep any money from what from what i can remember and they haven't asked for debrucing either and, and one of the other challenges is because the whole front range has been growing our tabor uh, limitation is based upon what's happening in jefferson county but if some of the communities around us are growing faster some of the impact still comes to Jefferson County, but the Tabor revenue allowance doesn't necessarily keep up with, to recognize that. So it, it, that's part, all those things have kind of added up to put us in, in this situation. So we're currently involved in discussions about where we want to make cuts and whether or not we want to ask the voters. And we, and we haven't made any decisions on any of that yet, but we are in discussions. We wanted to, to make sure we went to the community and, uh, and talk to you before we got too far in those discussions. Yeah, so for example, for 2020, the, the BCC has asked me to cut my department expenses by about 110,000. So I'm going through my budget cutting 110,000. Every department's gonna be different because they have different employee counts and services. The treasurer's office is a, is a source of revenue versus all expense, so that's where the rub gets. Uh, just real quickly, I wanted to mention that on our treasurer's page, um, some issues here we're, our hours are going to change we were 7 30 to 5 30 we're going to be 7 30 to 5 p.m because we're handling more cash than ever right now we're working with the west metro Doug task force and uh they're cashing checks and there's about ten thousand dollars worth of infra dollars that are coming back and forth with these agents uh we're also the, the public trustee they get a lot of cash some people will walk in and pay off pay off their debt with cash twenty three thousand dollars that the other day but I should be surprised how many people actually pay their property taxes with cash especially the older population they pay cash so we're, we're getting a, um, a used metal safe that has more safes inside so we're at, my concern is safety and timing so we're gonna have this safe and we're also gonna close a half hour earlier because we have to balance plus after five o'clock the atrium is pretty empty and I don't want somebody coming up there and trying to you know rob the county because we are the county banker so another thing we've actually added to our website is this financial reports and this notes tab. This looks familiar because we had it in Wheat Ridge too. But if you go to the financial reports um, and then click on this link, these are reports that we've generated through different means on the county. Um, what we have here is our quarterly investment portfolio report. This is the money we're investing to CSAFE, which the city also uses. And uh, so these are all PDFs. They have the quarterly investment. This general fund monthly report is similar to the city of Wheat Ridge. In fact, that was our, our basis for this one. It talks about all the revenues and expenses that we have as a county for those departments. And you can actually see it by month. Um, my treasurer's report, I generate bi-monthly. And then we have this miscellaneous reports. And one of them was the temp or the Tabor report that you saw. So these are going to be updated and added um, monthly. So if you have any questions about the budget or about um, finance you can contact me the commissioners anybody but the transparency part is what we're trying to promote here so all, all these new reports oh and then the last thing is see this tax distribution we have to legally by state law tell everybody how much we've billed for that month and collected for that month on taxes property taxes so this is a monthly report and annual report of how much money everything is public so uh, how much you owe and how much you've paid is going to be in this report. And it's not because I'm trying to get into your business. It's state law. We have to put it in through the state statutes, Title 39 and Title 24. And then um, the last thing I was going to show you before we wrap it up is, um, so we have this notes section. Also, this is new. And we go to the notes page. And so we have, um, now we have, Treasurer's duties, the GFOA, and that's what Mr. Ty was talking about, that we have to at least keep two months worth of uh, revenue, operating in revenue. And so 28 million is that number. That includes the Tabor 3% reserve. So when I came into the, to the system, 
there was no, that money wasn't set aside anywhere in our budget. So now we have that 28 million set aside in the budget, earning interest, and it's marked, earmarked monthly. And that's a separate line item at CSAFE than our, the regular operating funds. And then we have some documents here. So uh, thanks to you for having us. Thanks to the folks in Channel 8. Uh, we have a few more minutes if you want to ask uh, Commissioner Ty any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Treasurer DiTullio and, and Commissioner Ty. Interesting report. Uh, questions from Council for our county officials. I had, uh, I had one, if, if nobody else has one. Jer uh, Jerry, you spoke about um, uh, metro districts. Uh, are there a lot of metro districts uh, in the county? There's more than there's been in the past, and they're popping up every year. Every huh? city seems to have one now. They create a board. They uh, set the boundaries of that board. They vote to tax themselves. Then they send that information to the county, and we actually collect that funds off those properties, and then we distribute that money back. So here's an example of a bad metro district. Um, Fossil Ridge sent the wrong numbers to the county they were too short of the money and once we get that information in and the board of county commissioners approves those numbers we can't go back so the day that we were sending out property tax notices they were calling me up my first day there we're saying you know hold the press we got to get this money fixed because we're going to be three hundred thousand dollars short on the metro district and I, I legally i can't do that so um the board, their boards, they're like a pseudo city council. They have to make sure that they know what the mill levy is. They submit that on time to the November and December to our budget office. And those numbers are verified and then approved by the Board of County Commissioners. Everything is approved by the County Commissioners. Even your property tax assessments that you got in a couple weeks ago, those all have to go through the BCC before they go out. If they don't, that, that's an issue. So. Um, and uh, these metro districts, um, they function like an, a, a lot like a homeowners association. Right. They're like, a, like I mentioned earlier, they're like an HOA on steroids. They collect a lot of money. There's one down south in Lakewood that's collecting 50 mills a year for their metro district. Mm -hmm. And some of the metro districts, that's how they uh, finance some of the uh, infrastructure that went into the development when they developed the project. So some metro districts will include uh, a lot of the, uh, some of them include roads and that kind of thing you know, in, the, in the subdivision. Yeah. So. And um, it sounds like the county uh, has quite a bit of work to collect these funds and then disperse these funds. Does the metro district pay for those services? Everybody does. Everybody, we, we charge a percent for whatever we distribute that month. We charge a percentage based on state law of what we collect back as the service fee because we are the county banker. So if we send out a million dollars to the school district, we've held that back our fee for that collection and distribution. It's countywide. No one's exempt from it. But, but Mayor, I think that's a great question. I think we, we, have, we are in danger of having too many layers. And people, when they move into these districts, it's, it comes out as part of their property tax statement. And I do think there is a risk with, with too many metro districts of people becoming confused as to what mm. they're paying for. Are they paying for mm. government or paying for development? Mm. And uh, I, I understand what your question is, and I share that concern. I mean, uh, Mr. DeSoula, you, you, you said that all of the money that you collect and disperse, you, you get a fee on. So what we pay the, uh, the library, you would, we would, or the treasurer's office would collect a fee on that processing, right. and the uh, the uh, sheriff also, and and then X Y Z Metro District, you would collect a fee also, right. but but and there's different percentages of what depending on what they are, public safety versus school. The percentages are are defined by state statute. Uh huh. But uh, I mean, arguably the the. The sheriff's department and the and the public library are a benefit to all of the citizens in our in our county, and so are the are the services of the metro district a benefit to all of the citizens in our county, or only a particular group that lives inside the metro district? Just the group that lives inside the metro districts. Thank you. And the metro district, like I mentioned earlier, it's really residential, and your urban renewal and your TIFs are going to be commercial retail. More or less. Um, I don't, I have, we haven't seen a lot of mix of those yet. If they're building a housing development like on Yarrow, that's going to be all your metro district. If they're building a 38th and Wadsworth, that's going to be a urban renewal TIF, PIF thing going. But we don't collect the PIFs. 
that's on the sales tax. Okay. Thank you. Any, uh, any additional questions? Well, thank you for listening. And if you have any questions as we go forward on all these discussions, our budget, or like, like Jerry said, feel free to call us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Okay. Our uh, next item is agenda item number two. This is an update on the art space proposal. If, uh, if you got got a whole team, okay. Do we have enough enough chairs? Okay, or we can we can have some chairs over here, or you can you, however you can make uh, make people stand or sit and speak. Hi, I'm Diane Robb, Chair of the Cultural Commission. It is my pleasure this evening to continue our conversation regarding the possibility of bringing art space into our beautiful city. On February 4th of this year, the Cultural Commission shared with the Council the concept of art space. This nonprofit developer assists communities to identify effective, affordable ways to incorporate the arts into their civic agendas. After some wonderful discussion that evening, there was consensus amongst the Council that the Cultural Commission should further pursue this idea. And we did. We spoke to a number of individuals, including creatives, realtors, both commercial and residential, developers, business owners, property owners, along with people that have had direct involvement with art space. The interest and excitement was truly tremendous. We have formed a core committee of very diverse individuals, some of who are here this evening, that believe in and support the art space concept, which is to create, foster, and preserve affordable space for artists and art organizations. The first step is to invite art space to perform a preliminary feasibility study which provides comprehensive feedback about how we might create and then sustain a live, work, multi-use or other arts facility development here in Wheat Ridge. This study focuses on six specific areas. Project concept, the arts market, local leadership, funding and finance, potential sites in alignment with community goals. Good evening, Council. Uh, my name is Guy Namiesh. I'm a senior broker with Nostalgic Homes. Uh, I'm chair of the Parks and Recs Commission. I'm president of Jeffco Association of Gifted Children, and I'm on the executive board of the Outdoor Lab Foundation. I am not a weedy. And I'm not an inclusive citizen. This is not an NRS report. And I don't need a bike line to ride my bike. In fact, I couldn't care less about the number of lanes on any road. But I am a local real estate broker, and I sell Wheat Ridge every day of the year. My number one reason for buyers telling me to move, that they want to move here are schools. I bring buyers in for their first home. I bring in buyers for their last home. We promote Wheat Ridge for business owners, teachers, tech-savvy buyers, pizza makers, beer brewers, and the list goes on. They go to work, and they come home at night to Wheat Ridge every, night, every day. We promote Wheat Ridge for everyone. Well, almost everyone. They don't think like us. They have weird working hours. They use blow torches. They spray paint. They're bending metal at 2 a.m. Who does this? They're artists. They're painters. They're sculptors. They're glass blowers. They're musicians. They're artists that traditionally work in lofts, in warehouses, in garages, with minimum zoning regulations. This is to avoid paying rent on an apartment and then more rent on warehouse space. So buying a typical home in Wheat Ridge is simply not an option. It would be great to have an art district right here in Wheat Ridge. This is not about politics. It's simply about adding value to our community. 
And here are my partners to tell you more about this. My name is Melinda Stewart. I own Sweet Ridge Studios, and I teach art to kids when they are not in school. I have a home office, and I rent community spaces that I teach out of. I hold the belief that we are all inherently creative. Be that painting, knitting, playing music, gardening, cooking delicious food, or raising children, we all create. Creating affirms our existence and builds community. Creating builds community. Art builds community. Let's explore this idea a little deeper. A community is a group of people who share a sense of belonging and experience meaningful relationships because of a common identity. What we are drawn to, the food we enjoy, the music that moves us to dance, an abstract painting that opens our heart, or a realistic landscape that looks like home, are all our community markers that we use as individuals to find our people to identify our tribe. In our creating whatever form it takes, we make our internal worlds real on the outside, and then we know where and who we belong to. Art builds community. Oh, you love the open jam sessions at C+, me too. Don't you love the color and texture in Jaime Molina's mural at Right Coast Pizza? I do. And their pizza crust is delicious, right? Right. Art builds community and facilitates placemaking. The art space feasibility study will see if we have enough creators to benefit from an art space center directly contributing their dynamic richness to our community. I believe we do. Let's find out. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. I'm Morgan Richards, and I've lived in District 1 for 19 years. I'm the daughter of an artist. I'm married to an artist who lived in a studio with no running water. I've got two teenagers, so feel sorry for me. Uh, and I also work with rural electric cooperatives every day professionally, and those communities are often facing the same challenges we are. How do you cherish the past while you walk towards the future? Because change is scary for some, wonderful for others, and it's the reality for all of us. And that is why I agreed to put out my support for this project. Um, I've also most recently been on the NRS as a volunteer for a year to find out what your constituents my fellow residents want to see for our community. And what they want in overwhelming numbers is they want to see investment in our main corridors. While I was on NRS, my small team, which included Guy, as well as Councilman uh, Larry Matthews, Carol's actually sitting here, Carol Matthews, our small team collected the most one-on-one -on -one interview data during the first phase of NRS, and we heard clearly in consistency from your constituents that they want this investment in our community. Um, that included one very sweet resident of uh, Town Center North, who I spent 40 minutes helping her complete her survey, and she said, Morgan, we just need more places to go so that we can have more revenue. She totally gets it, that that kind of investment will benefit us all intrinsically as well as financially. I think that the uh, investment in the feasibility study in and of itself will help us learn more about a proven partner. It will inform the want of our, your consti constituents for a more vibrant corridors and our need for an increase in our tax re revenues to support our future. We, it will also give us more info on what is possible, as well as other ideas that could emerge from this very thoughtful study. I thank you for your consideration and your leadership in charting our shared path forward. Thank you. Good 
evening, Mr. Mayor and ladies and gentlemen of the council. I am Krista Lewis, and I am the executive director of Local Works. And I am proud to express our support of inviting ArtSpace to conduct a feasibility study for Wheat Ridge. The mission of Local Works is to advance Wheat Ridge as a vibrant and sustainable community. Indeed, building community is at the heart of our work, and our programming is designed to provide opportunities to connect, volunteer, create. An art space project aligns perfectly with this, which is why we wholeheartedly embraced exploring this opportunity when approached by the Cultural Commission. Local Works is eager to learn how we may incorporate an art space project with our continued efforts to create community and attract others to live, work, and play in Wheat Ridge. I am pleased to introduce Local Works board member, Anthony Palumbo. Hello, and thank you for your time this evening. My name is Anthony Palumbo. I am a commercial broker at Keller Williams Urban Elite and a board member of Local Works, and love to give back to my community. As a board member, I stand behind our mission and I'm excited about the prospect of an art space project in Wheat Ridge. I witnessed firsthand the benefits of an art space development while living in my hometown of Buffalo, New York. I purchased a property within a block of the development, and within five years, I watched the growth and transformation immediately surrounding me unfold while I lived there. It was great to experience an increase in my property value and also the influx of artists and creative types that were drawn to the community. As Krista stated, Local Works is proud to announce that our entire board of directors has unanimously voted to commit $12,500, half of the cost of the feasibility study, as a way to invest in our community and help advance Wheat Ridge. The feasibility study is valued at $25,000 as Local Works has agreed to matching funds of $12,500. We are asking the council tonight to approve the remaining $12,500. ArtSpace is a known entity with a long history of success with developing owning and operating arts facilities with projects around the nation. Let's take a good look at the possibility of bringing an arts-focused development into Wheat Ridge. I thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. Nice, uh, nice presentation. Let's throw it open for questions from Council. Mr. Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we have a privately, quasi-private tax pilot program uh, for art space that's going, taking place on 44th Avenue right now at uh, Swiss Flowers. You know, they, that was part of their concept when we tiffed uh, the development there for them to expand the facilities. Have we made any contact with them to see how that's been working out? Okay, uh, I would suggest... I, I think it's like phase two of their build. I don't think they've started to build it yet, but it's like phase two of... Okay. That goes kind of behind the shop. Um, I would just suggest that as cooperating partners, you may talk to the folks over there and uh, see how things are going and what kind of interest they've generated within the art community uh, as far as for um, if they've been able to leverage any interest in, and the interest that's been shown in their facilities coming up. Also, uh, one thing I was looking at too for the feasibility study is uh, they're talking about funding and my concern is they're talking about funding the initial effort. And I'd like to be assured that, that feasibility uh, study addresses long-term spending issues. And you know, once we, if we go buy something or, or do, if someone donates a building or whatever, what's it going to cost to maintain the program and, and who's going to monitor that and, and uh, direct it? Art space, when they do do a development, they maintain ownership and they maintain the sustainability of it. Mm -hmm. 
additional questions? Ms. Weaver? Um, I'm just wondering, as part of the feasibility, I'm, I'm actually very familiar with art space uh, because I helped work on a project uh, in my hometown. And, and I know that it can be a very, very successful concept. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't. This was in a, in a small town. And, and it seems like the conditions that are in Wheat Ridge are more like the experience that I saw. And so I am, I'm hoping that this feasibility study will also look at uh, the conditions of the community and the ability to support. Because one of the issues that happened was that um, the art space, because they own, own the, the building and everything else, they ended up needing to go back to the community for a lot more funds that, that simply the, the community couldn't support. Um, so I, I guess, I don't know if that's a question I would ask that that be part of the feasibility. And that, and that is part of the feasibility. One of the things we discussed with art space is when we first became familiar with them, all of their examples were in larger cities and even some of their um, brochures stated cities of 50,000 and more and we don't fall into that and I specifically discussed that with them and they said that uh, they do do a lot of projects with smaller cities in fact they are just now completing a project in Trinidad which is a lot smaller than we are and yes, that is part of the feasibility. We need to look closely at it. And that is why we do the feasibility study. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Davis? So mine um, kind of falls along the line of Ms. Weaver's, and I think I brought it up previously when, when this was presented. And it kind of goes back to the size of the city. And then, you know, we do have smaller part, you know, partnering cities or possible partnering cities that could be next to us, if it be Arvada or Edgewater and, and folks like that, will a part of the feasibility perhaps be bringing in um, perhaps another city or um, that type of thing to either help support the program, the space, et cetera? Do they look at that as a part of the feasibility study? They do look at the region, especially in a, in a town where we're all suburbs right. and we're close by one another. And I know they are talking with some people in Arvada, but it has not gone to feasibility study yet. They have worked with the city of Lakewood. So they're very familiar with the, with the area. They just attended um, this last week the Creative Districts um, statewide convention, and because they're very involved with that, with the Creative Districts, and that would be a part of it also to to understand the the Creative Districts that are close by, and how would Wheat Ridge fit into the big picture? So, kind of an add to that, Diane, I guess. Would they ever consider like a dual partnership is kind of more my question. Not necessarily, hey, Arvada is going to do it and we're going to do it and Edgewater is going to do it. But, you know, perhaps depending on where it's located, it could be very close to one of our neighboring cities and we could kind of work out a dual partnership type of thing. They are. They're very flexible, especially during the feasibility study part of it. And... Um, because we work closely with them in, in what they do during the feasibility study and who they meet with, um, that certainly should be a part of the conversation. Mr. Pond? Uh, just a couple of questions. So if we were to support this moving forward tonight, what would be the next steps? I see the the... Uh, preliminary feasibility study there's a reference to core group as well as to outreach and so I assume there would be some planning that would be conducted can you just kind of maybe talk about next steps after you know one if you were funded once art space receives the check for the feasibility study they provide us with a whole packet of how to prepare and in that packet, it advises us who to reach out to, what should we look for, um, 
it, it lays out the groundwork for us so we are totally prepared. So then in 60 to 90 days, when they come in to do the feasibility study, all that groundwork has already been accomplished. And they can come in and they know who to meet with, they know who the community leaders are, they know the properties available in Wheat Ridge. And so they, they don't spend the time uh, doing all of that research. They come in and take that research that we have provided them and they have given us the guidelines of what to bring forward to them. Uh, Ms. Dozman. Okay, I have a couple questions and I don't know if you can speak to the specifics. Um, so you had said that art space maintains ownership of the building. So does that mean that these will be rental spaces? Correct. Okay, and what are the stipulations for being able to rent the space? Do you know, like whether it's income you know, I based, not, whether it's I do not know all of, residency. All of, this, all of the specifics of, of that. And when do we, um, when do we learn? that you know what I and and that is something I can just call them and and uh, they can answer these specific questions okay mm -hmm. I'd appreciate that thank you we have <laughs> <laughs> right they uh, their headquarters is in Minneapolis but they do have a full-time employee that works here in Denver wonderful thank you Miss Weaver do you have a line item of uh, approximation of the feasibility study just what all the twenty six thousand dollars goes to as far as the research I just um, not a specific line item the areas of consideration mm -hmm. are project concept arts market local leadership funding and finance potential sites and alignment with community goals. Okay. It just seems like a lot uh, to not have a line item for, for what they're doing in, in the research study. And so I would, I, I mean, I am very supportive of this. I would just like to see mm -hmm. what time versus the hours versus the money of this $26,000 is mm -hmm. spent on what. They have, a, uh, I can share with you, a typical preliminary feasibility visit. Day one, they do a site tour, which they tour potential sites and buildings. They visit existing creative spaces and arts communities, such as studios, creative businesses, key arts organizations, and then dinner with the core group that evening. Day two, continuation of the site tour, exploration, of potential sites and creative spaces, uh, working lunch where we discuss the site tour impressions and the six areas of consideration, artists, creatives, and art organization focus groups, and that is to learn about the creative community's space needs, marketing for renting creative space, and economic considerations. Funding and financing leadership focus group, and that is to learn more about potential funding sources for a project, gauge the interest of local finance and business leaders. And then there is a public meeting, and that is to present to the community about art space and the economic and community impact of the arts, build support, and facilitate questions and answers. Day three is a civic leadership focus group, and that is to learn more about broader community goals, current initiatives and local priorities, and then a working lunch where they debrief with the core group. So it's a, a full three days of, of what they do. And this is all based on after they give us the, the roadmap to prepare for them. So do you get, sorry. Go, no, go ahead. Do you get a specific report I, I'm just, in, in doing research studies, you know, when I do something like that, there's a very specific format of, of the product people are going to get when I do a feasibility study. But Not yes, that I'm an art, art person, but, but you know what I mean? I, it's just sort of a value to what you're getting. Exactly. We do get a, a, a full report, a hard written report. Yes. Thank you. 
and that and that report is um, would be the property of the city and the intellectual property that it generates would be would be either I guess if local works were contributing 50 percent and the city was contributing 50 percent right and since cultural commission is heading this up um, I am assuming because we are part of the city it would be it would be the city's right and does does art space typically if, if they if they identify projects and stuff do they typically act as the developer yes so they bring equity into the into the project and they they would own it mm -hmm. so yeah. if if we identified a property that that was attractive for development would there be other uh, an opportunity for other groups to compete to, to build that project and, and I don't know enough about development mayor to know how to answer that oh that's that's fine thank you uh, mr. Matthews <clears throat> thank you I, I noticed a lot of the um, a lot of the items here you know they're going to come down and try and get to know us up close and personal um, do they have a plan or have they discussed a plan with you yet uh, as far as who's going to do some of the preliminary legwork on identifying these sites before they get here for this three-day visit so when they do get here they're as productive as possible exactly and that is what they provide us is with a whole road map for the core group to proceed with and so when they hit the ground, it's they're hitting the ground running, and the core group will beforehand takes this roadmap and and knows then how to schedule everything out. Okay, uh, additional questions, Mr. Bond. Well, just to kind of start a discussion, um, thank you everyone for coming and participating um, <clears throat> I remain I'm, I remain interested in in the concept as it was initially brought brought to us um, I think some additional comments have been made tonight that really tie it even further together um, uh, and I appreciate that so I think really looking at you know why would we why would we what's the value of this um, and I mean, to acknowledge it, I think there's risk. Obviously, there's we could do this and kind of not not find um, you know anything. And so I suppose we should acknowledge that and and understand what's the value of doing it otherwise. Um, uh, and I and I think some of the some of the visions that we've seen and some of the things that we've heard about. Obviously, if if we could research find facilitate something moving moving forward like this it would be well worth it we would say yes any one of these concepts images kind of um, added value placemaking community building that we could do that would be well worth it and I think and that's kind of that's that's where I'm at I think it's not that it's not a, a big number um, or a uh, or a small number I mean it's a real number it's an investment and there's risk with it but the value of it if it if it kind of you know came through and we found those things would be well worth it and I suppose we could say if we if we found that this wasn't viable you know in as much as it's running concurrent to some of the other things that we're doing like the NRS um, as we continue to dive in and try to understand what our community can carry and and what it wants even in the negative it would be a valuable investment to understand that we're not ready for this or we don't have the infrastructure for this and and it helps shape some of the other things that we're putting together as holistic documents so i, I think that's important i just want to pick up that i appreciate the um you know wanting to know a little bit more um about exactly where the money's going and what the product looks like at the end and so i don't know i mean i want to move this for forward appropriately but i do understand and and um and would yield to a request to at least see something that you know that um kind of affirms what what this is going to look like if we could see something like that uh, miss weaver Thank you. I actually I agree with everything that you just said. Thanks. Um, I have one more question for you. 
Um, and, and it has to do with several things that have been said and knowing a little bit about art space. They are the developer and so it, it's, my concern has to do with the same person doing the feasibility that potentially is the investor. And, and so I would like to know how many times art space has come back with these feasibility studies and said, no, you don't have a good place. Because um, that, that would, I think, make me feel a little bit better that it is a, a balanced feasibility study because normally we, you, one wouldn't really not have a, a, what am I trying to say, a bid process and have a different group do the feas feasibility study that is the investor. Does that, does that make sense? It does make sense. And I, I do want to, to state that, um, and I do not have the number for you, Ms. Weaver, but I knew, do know that there are some situations where the feasibility study has come back and said, you know, the full-blown art space is, is not right at this time for this city. But what they do provide us is with all the groundwork so we know what the creative um, aspects are of our city and what are the possibilities. So it's not as if we come back empty handed if they say, you know, the feasibility study says, I, I don't see it happening right now. But here are all the other options that you can look at and so it turns out to be a very positive situation. Lakewood came back with, it was not the time to do a, a full-blown art space at this time. But what they did do was have a full report on, on the creatives within the community, where their needs were, where there weren't needs, and art space now, even after, I think it's about two years now, they are still in communication because there were a few things that needed to happen before it, art space could actually develop within Lakewood. And art space in Lakewood continuously talk and keep up to date on one another. So it's not a, a yes, no, it's a, it's a yes or it's here's a lot of information and we we need to work it before we'd actually come in and do a development sure i appreciate that and and i do support the feasibility study thank you, thank you. sure just uh, get to a, get to a microphone so we hear you <laughs> and give us your name please also my understanding is that they are not the sole developers always, that they try to partner with local developers. Thank you. Mr. Matthews? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I think in all fairness, I, I do believe in giving credit where credit is due. And I would like to say to, thank, to Local Works that I appreciate their stepping up and sharing some of their budget in order to pursue this endeavor. Thank you. Um, additional discussion? Mr. Pond? Uh, well, uh, I'll attempt a con consensus um, and, and leave it open for uh, additions, but I, I would move or that for a consensus that we um, commit 12500 to um, go ahead and move forward with, with this feasibility. Um, within that request, I, 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 would like, I would like to see some of the product that um, if, if we could in terms of some of the previous feasibility studies. So we have a request to uh, contribute 12,500 with some additional um, information and studies from the arts, art space group. Um, do we have consensus on that? Looks like we have consensus on that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Shuffle a few papers here and we'll be ready for item number three.
Okay. okay. Our next item is uh, uh, agenda item number three. This is a city facility rental fee for nonprofits, and I'd like to invite or welcome Ms. Manwaring to uh, give us a, uh, a report on this. Hi. Thank you. Uh, in your packet, you have a um, memo, and it's focused on uh, the nonprofit. Uh, let me start that over. You have a memo in your packet that's focused on the fees for the Richards Heart Estate. As I understand it, there was a group that came in to the business meeting and requested either, uh, I wasn't sure if it was a fee waiver or a discount for nonprofit groups. So let me tell you that we don't offer discounts right now in any of our rental rates at any of our facilities for nonprofit groups. Uh, what we do try to do is offer a variety of fees at a variety of our facilities. So the Recreation Center, because it is in a special fund and is somewhat revenue driven, uh, as it's, um, we try to meet expenses at the Recreation Center, that's our most expensive facility and is focused on larger group rentals. Uh, the Active Adult Center serves a lot of nonprofit groups uh, and it is also rented out uh, at a reduced rate, really like $60 an hour compared to the rec center. So it helped me to know um, what you're interested in seeing um, and knowing in terms of our uh, rental rates. All right, we'll um, open it up for questions from council. There's a, there was a request from an outside uh, group that uh, not particularly connected with the city, but uh, has stuff, Ms. Davis. Um, just a quick question as far as usage. I mean, I could see this being a very used space on the weekends and that type of thing. Is it uh, used pretty widely during the week? Uh, no, not necessarily. Um, I think I had in the memo we had. Oh, did I miss that? Sorry. No, it's okay. It's fine. 21 rentals over the course of the year. Okay. So there's certainly capacity um, at the Richards Heart Estate for additional rentals. Mm -hmm. We did um, at one point market it for business meetings, but did not have a lot of success. Mm -hmm. Some of that has to do with it isn't air conditioned and yeah. there's a few uh, comfort level issues. Um, at the Richards Heart Estate related to business, but it is heavily used for private parties oh, yeah. and uh, weddings. Mr. Keeter. <clears throat> Following up on that, and it, this is probably both anecdotal and small sample size, but are you aware of any entities that have, that have inquired but not gone through with rental because of the, because of the rates or that, that would have rented if the discount were made available? Um, I don't have a number. I, um, <clears throat> as I was um, thinking about this over the course of time and how the rates have changed and evolved, at one point in time, uh, especially when we first opened the recreation center, I had numerous requests to either waive the fee or reduce the fee um, for nonprofits. And I began to say, well, we're also a nonprofit. We're just trying to meet our costs. So that's really how we evolved into uh, no nonprofit uh, rental rate. Uh, when we owned the firehouse, I had some different options. If people just were looking for a meeting space, I could discount that. But um, as part of the conversation, it's really who, what groups are nonprofit and what's, what kind of definitions do we want to have uh, moving forward, if that's something council would like to do, is have a nonprofit fee. Mr. Matthews, thank thank you. One of the my concerns about um, this particular uh, rental, and I, I really love the estate. Trust me. I mean, we've been out there for our meetings and city functions, but. There's an extensive amount of groundskeeping that's involved around this particular property. If we go somewhere where, I mean, like um, the senior center somewhere, I mean, they may have a little grass out in front, but this has extensive groundkeeping costs involved. And I think we need to be aware of it's more than just renting a room in the middle of a large business office type setting. <laughs> And uh, that's what would concern me a little bit if we start discounting too much there, because then we're going to start feeding off other budget parts of the parks. Um, 
other line items from the park just to keep the, the hedges trimmed. Right. And the parking lot. Right. Ms. Weaver? This is for the whole building and grounds, these rental rates? The rental rates in your, yes, in your memo regarding the Richards Hardy State are for the building and, and the grounds around it. Right, so if I want to book the whole thing, it's 1200 bucks for the day. Correct. That is super reasonable. Mm -hmm. Just in that business of having a large property. <laughs> no, it is also serves as a park, so oftentimes on the east side, um, there may be some residents using sure, it, but sure. in general, we charge uh, for reserved types of, if, if an individual or group would like to reserve an area, they're really getting exclusive use of that area and, and the rate reflects. And do you have uh, rules on how many people, how, how many people could I have for $1,200? Uh, you cannot exceed 100 at the Richards Hart Estate. I think those prices are extremely reasonable. You cannot rent mm -hmm. the space as it is, especially with the beautiful gardens and everything else, uh, anywhere for, for either those hourly or those, those rates. I think they're really reasonable. Ms. Davis? So I'll just add, because it's interesting, because I was um, not in my regular place of work today. We were at corporate office, and it makes me think of that, because we rented a room. Well, we didn't rent it. We used a room all day at corporate office. I ordered in Panera bread and um, for lunch. And when I was leaving, I was like, ooh, you know, are someone gonna come up and clean this, you know? Because we had more trash than the trash cans held and, you know, I, I cleaned up. But I, I, think, I, I think it is something that, I mean, I appreciate not-for-profit saying, hey, waive our fees. But with, with these types of events comes a lot of expenses, you know, from upkeep to having someone clean $35 for a cleaning fee is like a steal because we just had one office. I can't imagine, you know, several if it was outdoors and that. So, I mean, I, I appreciate the thought, but I really would feel comfortable with what you feel most comfortable with because um, I, I do think that, um, again, just today in my experience that I hope when we get there tomorrow morning for the meeting that someone came, you know, that we do have folks that come and clean up those those meeting rooms, but they don't always house that kind of thing. So there are a lot of expenses that you can't forecast, you can't predict, like, hey, am I bringing Panera Bread in, or is it just a meeting that we're sitting around and talking for an hour? So I, I do uh, respect the request, but I also respect that the cost itself to um, the city is, is not zero. Uh, Mr. Matthews? Yeah. The Brings up an interesting question too, because we do do use that somewhat as a park. Do we have a separate <coughs> line item for the estate? And I mean, when we talk about renting it, we're kind of talking more about the house, mm -hmm. although the whole grounds come with it. But um, does do you already subsidize the estate as part of our park system, our outdoor park system? Yes. Okay, so are we, if we're, if we're going to continue that, what, what, I guess before we decide on what to charge, if, if, we're, if we're covering the grounds, we'll say, as part of our parks that's in that budget, it's a different entirely, it's a different scope of question than if we're trying to cover the whole estate with rental fees, if you understand where I'm, where I'm going with this. I mean, like mowing the grass, if that's just part of your parks mowing the grass budget, we could charge less to rent the house than if the house had to support mowing the grass. I, I think I understand. I, is that a question? Well, yeah. I'm, I'm asking I mean, you're if, asking me if, if we add all of our costs together. Let's just say we, we spend $100,000 there a year. If $60,000 of that is groundskeeping, is that is that line item somewhere else out in the park's budget as a park outdoor park facility well we are in the process um, we have <coughs> in the past year been uh, working to incorporate all of the costs associated with a program or a service so what does it really cost us to offer a, a park shelter or the richard's heart estate so we're getting closer to that 
um, and then there's a lot of costs that can be added and it's really another conversation and then what I hope the end result will be is a fee policy and council can decide do you want re um, facility reservations or rentals to be a hundred percent cost recover and performances in the park to be free of charge so you start having that discussion and formalizing your fee policy right now I know that the flowers at the Richards Heart Estate are not broken out into what our costs are but we're pretty close to, to honing in on that and it does include uh, some grounds maintenance okay that's fine because I was trying to compare like if you go to Discovery Park or somewhere you're you're now you're on park property but we don't charge you for it and so if we can break down the scope of what you want to apply the rental to, then that would help determine what an hourly rental rate should or could be. Right, and we also have market rates. I did have um, staff do a survey, and we take a look at those every year just to see what other communities are doing, and some of them do have breakouts and fee tiers. Uh, we haven't done that <clears throat> just because the implementation and explanation to our residents, I think it's important to be able to explain to people why you have a fee and what it represents. So, um, that policy has just evolved into a flat rental fee. Mr. Keeter. So I remember when the folks came in that this is in response to, is that, is that the only time we've had a direct request for, to consider this question? Mm -hmm. To my knowledge, yes, but, I, but Ms. Van Waring, do you know of any other, or do they happen periodically? Yeah, we have had requests over the course of time. I can give you one example. Uh, I believe Lutheran Hospital used to have a fun uh, luncheon, a cancer awareness luncheon, and um, they always ask for the rec center free of charge. Because a rec center, because many, as I've said, many people would like to have the rec center fee of charge. I believe either a council member sponsored that from their discretionary funds, but the rec center was made whole with the fees. Right. This um, this question right now is my understanding specifically about the the estate. Correct. Have there been? Not that you, I'm aware of. I don't know of any other. You actually kind of got to where I was thinking, which is that there are other methods. There's the outside uh, outside group funding, <coughs> discretionary. Um, I'm not sure that they're, they're, that there's sort of enough rationale for changing policy just based on on one or two groups, and that's not to diminish their concern, but uh, and if hopefully they're listening, and that there are other avenues that they can they can uh, use to try to try to get some sort of relief without us necessarily having to kind of craft a policy when we don't really know what the impact's going to be. Ms. Dozman. So yes, the group that had come in um, asking specifically about the Richards Heart Estate did initiate this conversation, but I have had service organizations say that they've been priced out of our public facilities because it's really hard for them to cover the costs on a regular basis. Um, and so that's kind of why I had asked for a broader conversation to be had about this, not just about the Richards Heart Estate, but specific to our service organizations. Um, and you know, they, they work they are nonprofits that work completely on fundraising and, and raising money from the community. And so it's challenging for them. I mean, and whether membership can, can support it or not, but I know some organizations can't afford the rec center any longer and they've tried to come up with other facilities that they could use. Um, so I think that that's kind of, of a, uh, one of my concerns. Uh, I agree that I don't think that we should be changing policy for the exception. Um, but it would be nice to take into consideration our our service organizations that work within this community and, and help out our, our constituents and the outlying communities and, and with their service projects. Um, so I also wanted to ask, do you ever offer like any free days? Um, is it, I know that that's kind of a stipulation with some of the museums where there's, you know, blackout days where they offer like free services. And I think the rec center does it like one or two days, right? Where the residents can come in and try everything and whatnot. I mean, have we maybe considered offering facilities free on certain days of the year and it's like a first come first serve? Uh, 
we do offer a demo day at the recreation center where you can come and try things out but no we have never thought about doing that particular specific thing maybe at the outdoor pool one day uh, we've thought about doing that but not, have not thought about applying that to like rentals first come first serve mr matthews other than the carnation festival do we as a city really utilize that for for some of our own business and uh you know i'm just thinking you know like i can't think if 20 if local works you know holds any uh events there or anything but it seems like we're you know we may be i wouldn't mind us investing maybe a little bit of money in marketing that our that product because it really is a beautiful little place and I'm not sure we're we're really utilizing it even through city resources, maybe more city gatherings other than the Carnation Festival. It's the only one I'm aware of, at least. Uh, that so we're, yeah. So we're specifically talking about the Richards Hart Estate. I'm not sure if you're if council's aware that we do rent the top floor to the Colorado Parks and Recreation Association. That's their office space. So they help us maintain a presence in the building. And um, I recently ne renegotiated their lease, so they're paying a very reasonable charge, and then they're giving us some in-kind training uh, funds for um, our state conference. So I think that's a nice partnership with them. But otherwise, they tend to be private rentals at the Richards Heart Estate for a few reasons. There's not one big room, so it's limited, of course, to that one parlor or the smaller area, two smaller rooms. So it's mostly weddings and parties. Um, at the Richards Heart State at this time. And we do have a marketing piece and we have different, um, have marketed in different ways through wedding venues and then we have a flyer uh, that we hand out that's a nice marketing piece. I believe I attach some of the sheets in your packet, but uh, we could certainly try to focus. But just to get outside the nine dots, I mean, even if council held a retreat there sometime instead of going somewhere else, I mean, if we can bring attention to the bring attention to it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. maybe we should concentrate on that a little harder ourselves and as a city and uh you know if we have small meetings just kind of get the public exposure one of the other things that, oh i'm sorry no, go ahead, go ahead i was going to just mention to council one of the other nice features about our facilities is we don't have a cater that you're required to use or so it, it makes it affordable for people. They don't have to pack, you know, buy the whole package of food, et cetera, if you were going to a private rental facility. Ms. Weaver? I think it's a really great spot. And I, and I think, and I want to honor uh, Councilwoman Dozman's comment that is there, can we find a space where places, where nonprofits can meet? I'm just not sure this is the venue because what I'm super excited about is that this is a really reasonable thing that citizens of Wheat Ridge and beyond can rent for a party or a wedding. How many weddings happen there in a season? Well, we had 21 rentals. I'm gonna say the majority of those were probably weddings or some kind of private party. Is there, is there any space outside of here that would be one room or, uh, that could be, could address what was mentioned as far as well, a I, room that would be at a lower cost, or does that make sense? Where well, it does. Um, the recreation center, of course, has five different rooms. Sure. Um, so each building is treated a little bit differently. The active adult center is available in the evening, mm -hmm. but they're of course using that space during the day. Um, I have made package deals. Um, with our service organizations, the Rotary and Optimus. So they're really getting uh, their reoccurring rentals um, and they do have somewhat of a package deal. They use certain parts of the rooms at a discount or free of charge that other groups don't necessarily use. And those are the only <coughs> two because I don't believe in making too many exceptions or you need to make exceptions for all. But those two groups in particular um, we do try to work a little more closely with than a one-time rental. Thank you, Ms. Davis. 
So I'm going to just quickly add to that. So I'm a member of the Rotary Club, and we do meet every Monday. And we used to be at Lutheran, but Lutheran ran out of space for the public. So I think space is tough, um, tough for folks. And and I do think it's it's you know I appreciate to hear that there is somewhat of a you know, uh, you know you did look at those, and they are given a bit of a uh, a break because uh, they meet every Monday. Um, but I, I think that it's hard, uh, again, I think it's hard, it's a slippery slope to be like, okay, not for profits and, oh, if they have something to do with our community, because, I mean, just kind of looking at the list, I mean, it's, it's hard to decipher because I think indirectly a lot of these people could be all doing something for our community. It might not be as cut and dry as the Wheat Ridge Rotary, but, uh, you know, Mothers Against Drunk Driving is probably, they're probably doing things for our community too. They just don't have Wheat Ridge Mothers Against Drunk Driving, you know, in front of their title. So, I, I mean, I, I'm kind of along the lines of what Mr. Keeter said, that I don't know that I would change it. It does sound like you are recognizing and acknowledging some of our um, clubs that are, you know, homegrown Wheat Ridge clubs that are frequent renters, and we try to make some accommodations for them, but I would stick with what you're currently doing. Um, Mr. Keeter? This is kind of following up on everybody, but it, um, it sounds like we could maybe use the kind of broader examination of the city's rental spaces, figure out which ones are maybe underutilized and not getting the, the use that they could merit, and which ones may be getting more use, and, and then as kind of going to Ms. Dozman's point, the um, figuring out from there is is there some sort of kind of broader policy that makes sense in terms of, of finding ways to maximize is, you know, in with Richard's art, if there was a lower cost available, would it then get more rentals that somehow, you know, made it revenue neutral or even improved the, the finances? And But it, it feels like I think this targeted just the Richard's Heart estate doesn't, I'm, I'm still not sure I'm feeling the, the, the need for that specific kind of surgical strike, but, but that maybe we could use a, a broader look at the whole, at kind of the whole program. Mr. Matthews? Yeah, and I think our constituents come to us once in a while, and I know I've approached uses in various buildings at different times. I would be reluctant to try and tie your hands or something and say, well, we have to have X dollars per hour. I think that's why we have a director of Parks and Rec is to figure out where the curves cross, where utilization and, and uh, revenue kind of find that sweet spot. And I think we need to leave you with some discretion there and, and not tie your hands uh, too tightly, at least, on an issue like hourly rental. I think that's micromanagement on our part. Mm -hmm. Additional discussion? Does it sound like then that we would have consensus around uh, recommendation number one, to continue to implement best management practices and maintain the ability to rent and implement fee policy consistently to all groups? Is that, is that kind of what we have consensus on? Can I see a show of hands? general consensus on that mr. pond I would say yes except for that full analysis that you know needs to be done before you leave so um, <laughs> just as long as so I, I agree with the consensus but the full analysis and cross tabulation and everything so you know you before you leave well, no in all seriousness we certainly will take a look I know at you it will. <laughs> and we do have a marketing um, supervisor and he's very analytical and and they really they really do take a hard look at, at I'm here. oh I didn't need you okay <laughs> okay you have you have the direction that you're that you're looking for okay thank you very much um, that concludes uh, item number three we're here at uh, staff reports Ms. Mannering, you're our only staff person. Do you have a report for us? I do not. Okay. I wish it quit raining. Okay, well. I can give you a short update on Anderson. We're still um, 
moving forward, we're still planning on opening the swimming pool Saturday. I'm not expecting a large crowd, <laughs> but we'll, we are planning on doing that. And we did get one parking lot uh, paved. Okay. So. Except, I guess, um, up north they had a hailstorm, so they didn't cut any sod. So there's a lot of mitigating factors that, you know, come into play. <laughs> they, d they did come in with some sod, but we do. Still on the truck. Okay, thank you very much. Um, elected officials reports. Who has something that they would like to, like to disclose or to talk about? So no reports tonight. Is there any further business to come before our study session? Then we will stand adjourned. Thank you so much. And uh, happy, uh, we will not meet next week because of the uh, Memorial Day holiday. So we will see everyone back here in about two weeks for another study session. So have a nice uh, Memorial Day.